Next up, we have photojournalist Annie Griffiths. And Annie was one of the first female photographers at National Geographic. Over the course of her career, she has taken photographs in nearly 150 countries. She's the executive director of Ripple Effect Images, which is a collective of photographers who document programs that are empowering women in the developing world. She's published three books, and her photography has received awards from the Associated Press, the National Press Photographers Association, and the White House News Photographers Association. It's an honor, a true honor, to have her here today. Welcome, Annie Griffiths. What I love most is when I'm sitting in a hut and the people there have forgotten about me and they go back to their yeah. regular life and I get to witness it. That is my favorite thing about my job. When I started at National Geographic, I was one of the first women, but I was also the youngest by a good bit. I was so inexperienced. I was very intimidated and very apprehensive, working harder than I'd ever worked in my life. This was a completely new deal for me. I'd never been east of Ohio, and suddenly there I am at National Geographic working in three or four different countries on a project. As I started traveling overseas, the human stories that constantly drew me in were usually about women. When you humanize a culture or an issue, people are very capable of getting it. If I can help provide that perspective that motivates people to be more open-minded and kinder and more generous, then that's what I want to do. Oh. Last night, I was part of an accidental dinner where just eight different creatives from different parts of the business ended up at the same table, and it was, the energy was incredible. So here we are with 12,000 of you guys. So drink it in. Drink it in, because this energy is, is just magnificent, and only Adobe could pull this off. Um, I, I grew up in, yeah. I grew up in Minnesota and never traveled anywhere. Um, and one of the highlights every summer for me in Minnesota was we, we'd all go to the Apple River and we'd tube down the Apple River. That was high excitement in my world. Um, and it became so much fun because you could literally tube for a couple hours. And we'd bring like an extra inner tube for the cooler to have the beer and all the other stuff. And um, over time, we were loving this river to death. And the first time I saw a creative solution, simple creative solution, was somebody figured out how to, how to concentrate the trash. And so around every bend of the river, they put a huge, like, bigger than a trash can, a barrel, and they'd have colorful targets over the barrel. So of course, Everybody started throwing their beer cans and their bottles and their soda cans and everything. Um, and it changed the river. And I thought, that's creativity. That's creativity to get something done. And I am um, very practical, um, very pragmatic in, in many ways. But I also have an artistic soul. And these pictures are from my first uh, work with National Geographic when I was in my early 20s. And what an opportunity. You know, at that time, but I was so in love with photography. I just wanted to take really beautiful images. And, and then I got this platform to do it. And I, I kind of couldn't believe my own luck. And I also hope they didn't figure out that they had really shouldn't have hired me to begin with. <laughs> but. In, that, in those early days, I remember searching for beauty. Really, pretty much that was it. Beautiful pictures. That's, that's what I was interested in. And that's what I was trying to find wherever I worked. And I worked, you know, first a little bit in the United States and then started traveling. And 
what our job really was was to take pictures of things either that everybody knew about and, and do them in a new way, or to go to some fantastical place and take pictures of things people had never seen. And that was pretty much the job, and I loved it. And, it. and it was a gas. I mean, I was traveling. I'd like really never been east of Ohio, and suddenly I'm, I'm all over the world. Uh, that, this is in New Zealand. And I, you know, and, and, I, and I'm free. Now, it's enough freedom to, you know, hang yourself. <laughs> Because we would go off on assignment, and they'd just see us at the end, and there was no shot list. There was, you just had to figure it out. And this is in Namibia, one of my favorite countries in the world. And, and we got to do all this intrepid stuff. I've traveled in so many different ways, including camels, elephants, motorcycles, hang gliders, you name it. And it's fun. I mean, to me, it's, it's a blast. But as time went on, I kind of had this longing to, to seek more than beauty in my photographs. I really became more interested in the people than the place. And I wanted to show um, the connective tissue among all cultures and also the things that set us apart. So, of course, Argentina. This is in Mexico where a family was so thrilled that their daughter and her 15th birthday, her quinceañera, that they painted their whole house pink. I wanted those kinds of insights into cultures and people and things we share. And I also wanted to push back against um, generalized, you know, really, really offensive and inaccurate portrayals of other people. So my favorite thing always has been to get to the core of the culture. This is like, is this British? These guys actually raise mice in their back garden and then show them competitively, and I'm sure you figured out you're looking at a winner right here. This is, this is Mr. Wormald, who's the, um, the chair of the Calder Valley Mouse Club. I laugh all the time. You know, I see these are Aussies. How Aussie is this? You know, they're out on the Sydney Harbor and they dress their boat like Swan Lake for this parade. But they've been out there drinking beer for so long that they can't, their inner ballerina started coming out. And I looked over to see their crossed ankles and their curled toes, and you just can't make this stuff up. <laughs> it's a joyful journey. It really is. This is the graduating class of a high school in North Dakota. And, and this is a, a gaucho in Argentina teaching his nephew how to get a horse's trust, because that's what they do, they're horse whisperers. And this is the first rays of sunrise coming into the Dome of the Rock to end the fast of Ramadan. Those moments, that opportunity, has never, um, it's, I've just never felt jaded about it. I feel, I really, I hold my breath and I think, oh my gosh. Maybe never more than this picture, which is on top of Victoria Falls. And it was at a, a real turning point in my life where I realized that I wanted my work to be the target above the trash can that saves the river. I really wanted to, to have you know, as much meaning as possible in what I did. And so in addition to my work with Geographic, I started working for aid organizations. This was done for Habitat for Humanity. I worked on a number of projects with them. And this is all that's left of the mighty Colorado River when it reaches the Sea of Cortez because we have completely siphoned it off. And these environmental stories were important to me. This is what's happening to the Dead Sea. It's evaporating so quickly that all that's left behind are these salt formations along the entire edge of the Dead Sea. You know, I, I, I love working with nature and wildlife projects, but it's not my specialty. But the thing that I have come to realize is that if we want to save the orangutans, then we have to empower the local people 
to value that resource because it will actually bring them more money than slash and burning and planting palm oil trees will. That, that they have a treasure they can be proud of. I, did, I covered the oil industry in, uh, off the coast of Louisiana, and this was before Katrina. But the oil industry has so decimated the salt marshes that are the filter that protects the shore that, of course, now when these big hurricanes come, they're going to do so much more damage. I was born under a lucky star, and I think all of you were too. And it, whether it comes from genealogy or geography or just dumb luck, you're all here because you're fortunate. And I can't think of anybody who in the early years was more fortunate than I was. And yet all of us at a certain point come to either a crossroads, or in my case a train wreck, that um, makes us have to think really hard and make decisions about our future. So my perfect storm came in my mid-50s. This is my family that I grew up with. And you can see, of course, fashion icon that I am. I'm the one in the fuzzy white hat. Um, but in a single season, my mother took the deep dive into Alzheimer's. And my 20-year marriage evaporated in a humiliating way. And you can only have a pity party for so long. I remember reading an article at that time that said basically a woman in my situation should just get some cats and a vibrator and, <laughs> and call it a day. Well, sadly, I'm allergic to cats. So I started doing aid work. And I had learned early on that the most creative people on earth are poor women. They're unbelievable. They can take a scrap of metal or, or plants and, and pound things into a cooking pot or, or a piece of jewelry. I mean, this, this is pounded metal from a, a Bedouin woman in Syria. And, but the most creative thing they do is they keep their children alive in some of the most god-awful circumstances you can imagine. And yet, <laughs> yay for them. And so I started really focusing on programs that empowered women and their children in the developing world. And, uh, you know, I, I just I knew that they were the key, that they were the best investment we could make in our shared future. And the thing that, you know, doesn't get talked about much in this world is that it's working. There's less poverty. More girls are getting an education. It's not all doom and gloom. And it's because these people are magnificent. So I, I worked with a number of different aid organizations, and I was really feeling, this. OK, this is my calling. This is what I want to do. And, um, and I you know, went from refugee camp to refugee camp to communities that were doing something innovative and uh, you know, just a little cement and a little uh, engineering know-how, and women will do the rest. And it was, you know, it was really starting to become my DNA to work with these great women and to tell unreported stories. I, it's just unbelievable how few stories are told about women. And they're almost always portrayed as victims. And the focus is often on their sexual vulnerability. That's just not fair or accurate or OK in any way. They're amazing. And I came to a little crisis point myself when I took this picture. I was in a refugee camp in Kenya, and I met this Somali woman, Marwa, and I just loved her. And her little girl was so sick. And I just, I took this picture, but I had my own personal crisis. I mean, what am I doing? How can I make a dent in this? This is maybe hopeless. But I did my job, and two years later, I was in a refugee coordinator's office in Richmond, Virginia, and this picture had been torn out of the aid group's calendar and put on the wall. And I saw it, and I, and I said to the refugee coordinator, oh, wow, that looks familiar. And he said, 
yeah, and she's doing great. And I said, you know her? He said, oh yeah, she's one, they're one of our refugee families and everything's fine. And, and it was just like this enormous relief. I didn't get her out of the refugee camp. I take pictures. But if my pictures can support the, the people who are doing this important work, then that's what I want to be doing. And three weeks ago, Adobe helped me find Marwa. So here she is here. And, there's, and there she is now. And that sick little baby is 16 years old and looking at colleges now. It's, uh, it works. It works. So after that, I called my girlfriends, who are some of the best photographers on earth, and I said, you know, these were women who were already doing aid work and some really great guys too, and I said, look, why don't we learn from the women we document? that if we work together, we can get a lot more done. And they all said yes, and we started Ripple Effect Images. And in six years, we have worked with 26 aid organizations, we have done 28 films, and we have an archive of 25,000 images, and our aid organizations have reported raising over $10 million using those assets. And it's about you know what women need. It, 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 you know we know what's basic: water. You know, and the joy when they actually can see water coming out of the ground, and they're so willing to do the work. And then, for the first time in many of their lives, they can actually be clean, because if water is so precious that you're walking 11 hours to get it, when you get back, you're not going to bathe. You're going to, you know, keep your kids alive. So. We look at all as solutions across water, food, you know, these great agricultural programs. Most people don't realize that most of the farmers in Southeast Asia and Africa are women. Um, and they are so eager to learn that if they plant beans instead of corn, their kids will get better. You know, they'll be healthier. They, that, that, you know, livestock can survive climate change if you mix up the feed. And they can be taught how to tell if their kids are healthy or not. And you can see, they take it so seriously. They're, this is an area of Indonesia that had terrible malnutrition, and the women are like now leading the communities in making sure that kids are safe. This, this community is so remote, I crossed a river 33 times on a motorcycle to get there. And they had never heard of a germ. How could they? And so this aid organization, was teaching them about basic nutrition and health and that if you wash, your kids won't get sick as much. And it made a huge change in the whole community. The one that breaks my heart is, is the single biggest killer of women and of kids five and under in the world. And I bet hardly anybody knows what it is. It kills more people than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined, and it's household air pollution. And uh, it's completely preventable. It's from cooking and heating fires and lighting with toxic chemicals and, and fossil fuels. And this is a, a woman who was testing clean cook stoves in India. And you can just see that, you know, that, that her joy that she can actually even have her family in the kitchen now because they aren't fleeing the smoke. Education. Oh, it's what every, every mother wants for her kids. And the girls want it too, let me tell you. And, and there are really leading countries like Rwanda who've made it mandatory education for all children, not just boys. Because in so many places, if a family's going to send someone to school, it's going to be the boy. And, um, and school is prohibitively expensive for, for many, many families. But they learn, and it changes their life, and they, and they go on and, and lead their communities, and they gain dignity. It's, it's the heart of empowerment. 
This is the poorest woman I've ever met in my life, and I say that because she had lost seven children to malnutrition. It just, it doesn't get worse than that. And she got a little micro loan, and she met this little girl who was an orphan, and she took her in, and she bought a goat so she could give the little girl milk. And then she started breeding goats, and she started making a little more money, and the first thing she did was send this little girl to school. And as I was, le I was with them for much of a day, and as I was leaving, the little girl came up to me and asked me for my notebook and my pen and brought them over to her, her mother to show me that she had taught her mom to read and write. And that's the ripple effect. And people who don't have, you know, people who have no education are still perfectly capable of being taught. So this program, they were teaching women how to build solar lanterns. They're solar engineers. And so this woman had built 50 of them. And this is her final exam where they give her a broken one to see if she can fix it. Well, she passed. Now look at the body language as she goes to give a bottle of light, 50 bottles of light to all her girlfriends. That's empowerment. That's what's going to work. And look at the girlfriends. This woman never had a day of education. She was taught to run a solar desalinization plant in a really, really desperately salty part of India. And I went there to cover the salt farming, which is often done by young girls. I was there with a the health group, which, and usually, you know, you don't realize what a toll it takes on the human body. And they were helping. But at the end of the day, this little girl ran over to a solar lantern that I hadn't even seen. And I said to her, you have a solar lantern. What do you, now what do you do? With, you know? And she told me she goes to school at night. And in her region, all the kids who have to work during the day now have an opportunity to go to school at night. So there are 70,000 children in her region who are going to school at night because of solar lanterns. And women are learning to, to work collectively. You know, they're um, farmers who used to just be laborers, and now they come together. This is the farmer on the right. She's finding out the quality and the weight of her grain. Meanwhile, out back is the commodities broker. You can't believe what a woman with a cell phone can do. And she's calling down to the market to get the going price for, for um, that crop, and then she undersells it by a couple of rupees, and she comes back in, and whoo! These women will never go back. They get it now. I'm going to finish in Pakistan because I have these experiences a lot, but I just want to impart one little precious evening to you. I was there covering a water issue. We were in a completely remote part of Pakistan, and uh, we were hours from the nearest road, and so we knew we were going to have to sleep in the desert, and this little community asked if we'd like to stay with them, and we said yes. And so with that, they brought out their two best cots and their best blankets, and the girls brought We were sitting out in the open air on, the, on our little beds, and the girls brought us soup to drink. And, um, and then it was really getting dark. And they asked if we would like music. And I said, we would love music. And with that, like five little elderly men with homemade instruments came and made a circle around our cots and played until we fell asleep. And I promise you, these people had never heard of National Geographic. They're like people everywhere who have nothing, they give everything. So as you guys go through your careers, your beautiful, brilliant careers, hold in your heart something that's speaking to you so that when your perfect storm comes, you're going to be available. You're going to kind of have a path that comes before you. Think about what you want written on your tombstone. A couple months before I turned 60, Glamour magazine did an article, and they called me a camera-toting badass. <laughs> and that's what I want on my tombstone. Thank you very much.